You're about to watch two programs from the BBC's world-famous Natural History Unit on the tracks of the wild otter and the mouse's tail. Just one of the wildlife specials priced at £9.99 each. Also available, aliens from inner space, animals that could come from another world but quietly inhabit the oceans of our own, now captured on BBC Video in all their colourful beauty. And on the same cassette, just when you thought it was safe to go back into the water, the fastest claw in the West tells the story of the killer shrimps. Many strange creatures haunt the depths of the sea, but few have such an unexpected talent as the mantis shrimp. Also on BBC Video, Bird Brain of Britain, a light-hearted search for the cleverest of our feathered friends. Simon King devises some fiendish feats for the wildlife to work out. And on the same cassette, The Flying Gourmet's Guide. The Flying Gourmet's Guide's most exclusive restaurant. In the gardens of Buckingham Palace, a bird table by royal appointment to Her Majesty. Open only to a few select guests, this restaurant is set in landscaped English parkland with palatial vistas. BBC Wildlife Specials also contain some touching true life stories, including Squirrel on My Shoulder, the story of Sammy, an orphaned grey squirrel fostered with a litter of kittens. I tried giving the young squirrel a start in the right direction, staying close at hand, ready to jump to the rescue if the cat decided to turn on the uninvited guest. On the same £9.99 video, the highly acclaimed Brockside, a true life soap opera starring families of badgers that live in and around towns and have adapted to an urban way of life. wilderness of wind and water, the most remote of the British Isles. Millions of years ago, this land was covered by ice. Eventually the great glaciers melted and the sea level rose, creating the hundred islands which we now call Shetland. Even today, man has left little sign of his presence on these lonely shores. So it was to Shetland I came, in search of a very special animal. Shy, elusive, and full of magic for me. These northern shores are one of its last retreats, one place where luck or long watching, may at last reward you with a brief glimpse of the wild otter. Dawn, my search begins. So rare, so shy is the otter that it has hardly ever been filmed in the wild. Indeed, even many day-to-day -day details of its life are hardly known. The otter retains its mystery. Before I can film it, I must learn to know the otter. To live as the otter lives. I pace my life to the rhythm of the tides. Generations ago, the Picts did the same. Their broch, their fortified house, still stands, as it did when the first Viking ship entered the bay. The house is deserted now. 
but the otters remain. In the ancient walls, they have made their halt. A hundred generations have carved out a sparse living on these bleak and windswept islands. They trap the otters for their warm fur. Today they are no longer hunted here. Throughout most of Britain, most of Europe, the otter has been harassed, its living places polluted and destroyed. Here, it is left in peace. And suddenly, I find a clue. Footprints between the tiles. An old rabbit burrow, widened and smoothed by the otter's silky fur. At a streamside halt, I see more signs. Fresh scratches in the peat. A cobweb broken. And then... It's gone. Downstream, perhaps. As they travel, otters announce their presence by sprinting, marking prominent rocks with remnants of their previous meals. But these fish bones are dried up, at least a week old. The trail is cold. Early spring days pass quickly. Gradually, my knowledge increases. I begin to see otters more frequently, especially one particular animal. Too far away to be sure, but I think it's a female. A bit too small for a male. It seems she has her favorite rocks she likes to rest on, but she's always cautious when coming ashore. Every day I wear the same clothes, move in the same way. Perhaps she's starting to recognize me now. But still she disappears. Two days pass, no sign. Is she still here? On the third day, I find her again. Otter's eyesight is poor, but I must keep downwind. Her nose is sensitive, her ears too. The female's about a metre long. I recognise her by the white spots on her top lip and the crab bite on her nose. When you get used to them, you can see that males have a broader muscle, larger ears, a darker pelt.
This one's a stranger. I'm uneasy. If he sees me, he may try and warn the female and frighten her away. He does alert her. I'm not sure how. But she's not concerned. At last, perhaps, she's beginning to trust me. She decides to move, but instead of avoiding me, she actually comes ashore. Now she's just a few feet from me, nervous, like me. But determined to mark her territory, that's important to her, for the sprints she leaves are highly scented. In this way, she communicates her presence to other otters. Once more she comes ashore, and this time, closer than ever before, she settles down to sleep in my presence. At last, she's accepted me. Stormy winter is nearly over. Life is easier for all fishermen. Seabirds return to their cliffs to pair up. The female otter is about to do the same. At first, the approach is cautious. The male has a territory of at least seven kilometers, overlapping the areas where two or three females live. For much of the year, they go their separate ways. But now it's spring, the time for courtship. They're on the alert as they leave the safety of the sea. The more cautious male checks the air for hostile scents. Another of the island's fishermen is starting its courtship, the red-throated diver. They gather on the freshwater locks behind the shore. Pair after pair fly in to join the bizarre rituals. Many pairs assemble here to display, but they return to salt water for feeding, like the otter. The whole history of Shetland and its wildlife is bound up with the richness of the surrounding seas. Ever since the islands were freed from their blanket of ice, these waters have provided food for human and animal colonists alike, including the otter. The ancient coastline is now three meters below the surface, and so provides large areas of shallow water 
rich in fish. The otter's whiskers help her to locate prey in the dense beds of kelp. Otters feed mostly on live fish, especially slow-moving bottom feeders, like the lump sucker. A good fishing spot often seems to attract more than one otter, and butterfish are a favorite prey, small enough to eat without coming ashore. There's seldom competition among otters. Some of their bird neighbors are much more territorial, the black-headed gull, for example, or the ringed plover, which will soon be making its scrape here on the shore. Mid-May, a time of plenty is at hand, for as the sun warms the sea, the plankton blooms, supporting a profusion of life. Kittiwakes return after a winter spent at sea, recolonizing their breeding cliffs. Strange ritual displays enable many pairs to breed close together with the minimum of violence. But Shetland seabird colonies are some of the largest in Europe. Competition for space is intense. Summer is here. Long days of sunshine and brief nights of twilight. The land of the simmer dim. The noisiest time for seabirds is the quietest time for the otter. Courtship is over. She looks plump. Perhaps she's pregnant. If so, she won't give birth for another two months. By that time, the seabirds will have completed their breeding season. The arrival of the Arctic Tern heralds the brief Shetland summer, a much-loved bird, a swallow of the northern seas. A 
male offers a sand deal to a female who lands in his territory. But she's not given it immediately. It seems there has to be a tug of war before they become a pair. Otters will very occasionally raid turn colonies. Not for the eggs, but the adults. It's a time for lots of grooming. Otters moat twice a year. The full moat is in July. The double layer of fur will keep her warm in the coldest of water. But seas are comparatively warm now, and at their most prolific. Magnificent gannets, gathering food for their growing young, crashing into the sea at 80 kilometers an hour. One of the world's greatest plunge divers. The seabirds will soon be dispersing. Arctic terns are restless, gathering like swallows before departure. Just as they herald the arrival of summer, so their departure marks its passing. Soon they will head south to the sun, leaving the Shetland shore to the otters and approaching winter. But the autumn shore seems empty. My otter has been missing for several days. If she really was pregnant, she should have given birth by now. Perhaps she's lying up in a halt with her cubs. There's no way of knowing. I search for the female and find her in the late afternoon. She swims purposefully. I follow as fast as I can, hoping she'll lead me back to the halt. She's caught my scent, but continues on her way. She's aware of my... The halts are nearly always close to the sea in fallen boulders, old ruins, in cliffs, or at the top of a stack like this. If there are cubs, this is the time of year they're likely to emerge from the halt for the first time. I wait, tense. Then, disappointed, she sprints to let others know she's passed this way.
the halts are evenly spaced, about 500 meters apart. I follow her towards the next halt, but she disappears into the kelp and is lost until nightfall. When I do find her again, she's very nervous, hardly daring to move, warily checking for danger along the beach. Every move is tense. I begin to suspect she does have comes. I search again at dawn. Suddenly, she appears, carrying a small fish. Normally, she'd eat that offshore. Surely, she must have cubs. family of wrens suddenly become alarmed. What has disturbed them? She checks the shore, alert for danger, nervous, smelling human scent. Mine. The wind has changed, but she doesn't realize and is looking for me in the wrong direction. At last, two little fluffy bundles, a moment of delight, excitement. And relief. Mother and cub return to collect the little female. Their spiky fur acts as a life jacket. They can hardly swim yet, let alone dive, and their mother provides all the food. Their father still shares the territory, but he plays no part in bringing up the family. He's not welcome near the cubs, and whenever they meet, the female drives him off.
Their mother still suckles the cubs, but she started bringing them solid food too. They haven't quite learned how to cope with it yet. The female hunts close to the shore, keeping an eye on her young family. But as soon as she dives, the cubs are worried. On Shetland, adult otters are active by day or by night, but small cubs are more often brought out in the shelter of twilight. Winter nights are long in this northerly land. They will have time to grow and to learn in safety. Geese cross the night sky, heading south from their Arctic homelands. Other migrants arrive under cover of darkness. Sea trout, digging out their spawning reds. The otter will take them if she can. She's equally at home in fresh water or in salt, for she's the same species of otter as used to be found throughout Britain a hunter of fish in sea and river alike. Trout are usually too fast for the otter, but eels are great favorites and easier to catch found hiding under boulders. The female can now leave the cubs on their own for short periods. They're three months old and squabble over their fish like a couple of puppies. She'll only be away for an hour or so. While the cubs are feeding, she can hunt better on her own. Cubs will eat anything they're given, but the mother is particularly fond of sea scorpions and keeps them for herself. The cubs roll and play like any high-spirited young animals, but throughout their lives otters never seem to lose their joy in the water. After a couple of hours, the feeding expedition is over and the female leads her family towards an inland halt. I follow quickly. They've disappeared. Though I can still hear the cubs whistling. The stream runs underground here. 
As the cubs scamper to and fro, hoping to catch up with their mother, I try to guess where they'll pop up next. At last, the family comes to rest at the edge of the stream. I'm careful to keep my scent downwind. But perhaps I moved. Shetland is a wild, tempestuous place. The islands are drenched by frequent storms sweeping in from the Atlantic. Then the wind swings to the north. The islands are transformed from shades of brown and gray to black and white. For several days, I don't see the otters, but they still seem to be out hunting. Even in the coldest weather, there are plenty of fish in the shallow waters. I find the family's fresh tracks and follow across the headland. These tracks on the beach are very fresh. I crouch behind a rock, just in time. The cubs are now six months old. Their mother often brings them lithe prey, another stage in teaching them to catch for themselves. and more, the mother brings in fish after fish, but still the little female tries to share the place with her brother. This time, the female cub is given something much more substantial, a large lump sucker. Both cubs are now starting to catch small prey for themselves. The male cub eats his butterfish with evident satisfaction. Large fish like this are seldom eaten completely. The great blackback gull knows the otter's habits and waits to finish off the remains. The 
family often roll and play together in an ottery tangle. I love watching them. Throughout all the months the cubs are growing up, they remain a close-knit family. And now their mother can lead them on hunting forays up and down the coast. They sprint to mark the route of their journey and drink from the freshwater burn. It's March. Even in the far north, there are signs of spring. My second spring with the otters. Eider ducks are one of the first birds to display. The handsome males compete for the drab-looking female. For the common seals, this is a quiet spell. Their time of birth and mating is in the summer. The weather is warmer now. They bask as the tide ebbs, leaving them high and dry. But spring, in Shetland, is notoriously fickle. In this boiling sea, the cubs are in danger. They could be swept out to sea or dashed against the rocks. Despite the thundering sea, I can hear their anxious calls, though their mother doesn't seem to notice. She continues fishing in the teeth of the gale. Adult otters seldom use their voices, but cubs call continually if they get separated. Nine months old, the cubs are well grown and almost look like adults, but they're still not independent of their mother.
They're capable swimmers now, and they can catch their own fish. But their mother can still surprise them with something a bit unusual. The little female is given the octopus, but she doesn't quite know how to cope with it. Even after so many hours with the otters, I never weary of watching them. It's hard to believe that any animal can be so completely at home in land and water alike. Cubs stay with their mother for the first year of their lives. Soon the female will drift away. Once again she'll take up her relationship with the male in preparation for a new family. The cubs themselves won't breed till they're about three years old. Until then, They'll be wandering the shores, resting peacefully among the rocks, fishing and playing in the shallows, as otters have done for generations. But I shall no longer be here to see them. My search is over. I must leave the hundred islands of Shetland and that very special part of my life that I shared with a wild otter.
We human beings reckon to be in charge of our fellow animals. We use them for food, for companionship, to guard our houses, but for every animal we choose to have round our homes, how many unseen and uninvited guests? Round this Wiltshire cottage live four sorts of mice. Take just one of them, the wood mouse. Even in these overcrowded islands, there are more wood mice than human beings. We don't often see mice, but their lives are closely linked with ours. The special habitats they need are often custom-built by man. Coppicing, an ancient rotational method of cropping hazel and sweet chestnut trees, provides man with fencing, jumps for his horses and spars for his thatched roof. But it also provides the ideal habitat for the dozing mouse, the seven sleeper, in other words, the dormouse. Not a true mouse, in fact, but a close relative of the mouse family. The dormouse needs to live on the woodland edge, and coppicing constantly renews just the conditions it needs for feeding, breeding and hibernating. Coppiced woodlands are becoming scarce, but the ideal home for another species of mouse is easy to find. The house mouse seems at home in a man-made hole in the skirting board, but its ancestors evolved on the steppes of Central Asia, from which it hitched a lift with man. It's now probably the most widely distributed of mammals, found almost all over the world. House mice now thrive in the concrete labyrinths of high-rise flats, in the depths of coal mines and in coal stores where the temperatures kept well below freezing. Here in Britain, some house mice share human habitats all the year round. Others move in from the countryside with the onset of winter. House living house mice breed throughout the year. Straw, paper, even electrical insulation form the nest. If a pair bred at the start of the year and their young survived and bred and so on, by New Year's Eve, there'd be a grand total of 2,500 mice. Early spring, in gardens and woods, though sometimes in houses too, lives a close relative of the house mouse, the wood mouse. From April onwards, there'll be wood mouse litters in the underground nest. These tiny blind young weigh only one to two grams at birth, but they grow rapidly. They'll be weaned in two and a half weeks, by which time the mother will usually be pregnant again. The mouse's eye view is very different from ours. Its vision is poor, it can do little more than distinguish shape and movement. Its picture of the world is built up of tastes and smells and sounds. So, as it moves out into unknown territory, it's building up a sensory mouse map in its mind, starting typically by skirting the wall of the room. In emergency, it can then head instantly for home. Even food must be thoroughly inspected before starting to eat. The new arrivals check carefully too. They're encouraged by recognising the smell of another family member. A house mouse needs a fifth of its body weight in food each day, and remarkably, hardly any extra liquid. In houses, although it shows preferences, it will eat just about everything human beings eat, as well as odd items like soap and candles. We have a number of misconceptions about mice, and here comes one of them. A kitten, according to a 10th century law, was valued at a penny. But once a cat was a proven mouser, it was worth as much as fourpence. Sadly, the truth is that even a proper fourpenny cat is not particularly efficient at clearing the house of mice, though many mice are pretty good at getting out of the way.
The first young wood mice of the year are ready to leave the nest. The house mice have been active all winter, but for the reawakening dormouse, the year is just beginning. For five months, it survived the hazards of being eaten, starved, or frozen to death. But there's a further ordeal to come. During hibernation, the dormouse's whole metabolism slows down. Its respiration and heart rate fall, its temperature drops, even the composition of its blood is altered. The return to normal takes up to 12 hours and imposes a great strain on the animal. Altogether, from one cause or another, up to 80% of dormice are thought to die during hibernation. Having safely emerged, the dormouse has no time to lose. During hibernation, it has lost half its body weight, and now it has to feed up rapidly on buds, grass seeds and green shoots before the real business of the year can begin. Over on the far side of the cottage is another habitat, man-made for man, but also for mouse. Our smallest rodent, the harvest mouse. It's specially adapted to life among the corn stalks. The tip of the tail grips tightly on grasses. It also serves as a brake. Its skeleton is light, only 5% of the body weight. It has an excellent sense of balance and uncanny skill in judging if a corn stalk can bear its weight. Unlike other mice, the harvest mouse is active by day and by night, so it's vulnerable to two lots of predators. But by far its worst enemy is modern farming. Man creates its home, but also destroys it. Early summer, and in the hazel coppice, the dormouse has built itself another nest. Whereas the hibernation nest is at or below ground level, the breeding nest is usually about a metre up, in the fork of a sapling or a bramble. It's a large, rather untidy structure, often made of honeysuckle bark and dry grass. The dormouse weaves the nest right round herself, then lines it with finely shredded material ready for the birth of her litter. Butterflies are on the wing, summer is at its height. In her carefully constructed nest, the dormouse prepares to give birth.
This scrap of life, blind and naked, weighs only three grams. It looks almost like a premature birth. As each baby is born, the mother picks it up and cleans it thoroughly. She finally produces the last of her four young, an average litter, and severs the umbilical cord. The eyes of the babies don't open until they're 18 days old. In the early stages, they just have folds of skin where their ears will be, and the toes are all stuck together. But even at this age, they already show signs of the whiskers, which will be so important to them in later life. Back at the cottage, living is easier. The house mice move out to the gardens and sheds. Their move doesn't go unnoticed. The dormouse's breeding nest needs to be well concealed. The young dormice remain in it for a month, far longer than the other species. The much smaller harvest mice, for example, will be independent in half that time and may have been driven from the nest area by their mother. Once their eyes are open, they become much more active and boisterous and push their mother around the nest as they attempt to suckle. The wheat is ripe. The harvest mouse world is destroyed. Adults can flee from the advancing combine, but young, still in the nest, have no escape. Mice who live with man share his harvest, share his protection. They make their nests in sites which wouldn't exist if they weren't deliberately created, in the coppice, the house, the harvest field. They have many advantages. But there are hazards too. What man makes, man destroys, perhaps wiping out a whole population of mice as he does so. However, even a relatively independent life doesn't free mice from sudden danger. In their network of runways under the tree stump, the wood mice are building up a good supply of nuts for the coming winter. Although they're less active during the cold weather, they don't hibernate like the dormouse, so they need to stock up the larder. And they're liable to be visited by a much fiercer and more successful predator than the cat. One of its country names is Mouse Hunt. In other words, the stoat. Meanwhile, the cornfield has been ploughed up. The surviving harvest mice take refuge in hedgerows and gardens. They can continue to breed till November, weather permitting, but in a wet autumn, up to 80% of the young will die. Harvest mice are so small that it's hard for them to maintain body heat.
The surviving young are easily recognized. Their coats are grayish brown, unlike the russet coat of the adults. With luck, they'll overwinter and produce the first new generation next spring. The young dormice, too, have grayer coats than their sandy brown mother. At four weeks old, they're starting to make their first excursions from the nest. As a rule, dormice are only active at night. Their large eyes and long whiskers help them to find their way through the branches without the aid of light. But young dormice not uncommonly emerge before it's dark. This youngster already has a good sense of balance, though perhaps its movements are more jerky than an adult's. Dormice are well suited to life in the trees. Both front and back feet are adapted to grasping twigs and have small pads to help them keep a firm grip. The distinctive bushy tail. The dormouse is our only small mammal to have one. It isn't used for grasping, but for balancing. Brambles are very important to dormice. The hazel and the bramble together are the two most crucial components of dormouse habitat, providing food, cover and nest sites and they're ideally combined in a hazel coppice like this. Sadly, the habitat that's so popular with dormice is no longer popular with man. The fences, the thatching spars are not much in demand today, and as a result, dormice are far less common than they were a century ago. As autumn approaches, the dormouse settles down to eating in real earnest. Nuts are very important to it. They contain a large amount of protein and fat, enabling the dormouse to double its body weight with a reserve of food for the coming winter. If the nut is not very ripe, it will be eaten on the twig. But dormice usually prefer to carry it off to a chosen perch. They'll often devote five minutes or more to a single nut. Dormice have a special technique for dealing with a nut. Holding it in their front paws, they gradually turn the nut round, cutting through the shell with their lower teeth. They then remove the kernel bit by bit, perhaps with the help of the tongue. The neatly opened nut, with its smoothly chiselled edge, is a real Dormouse trademark. But finally, the eating has to stop. The dormouse will once more roll up into a ball, curl its tail over its face, and retire for the winter. As winter closes in, the house becomes an island of warmth and comfort, and the uninvited guests flock back to take advantage of it, and the many facilities that human beings provide. There are many cheddars on the market, but only one original. So what makes this the family favorite? It's the gorgeous flavor, full of country freshness and goodness that our home-produced cheddar has. So when you're buying cheddar, be choosy. English, a better bit of cheddar. Yes, of all the mice that live with us, House mice are the champion opportunists. Their huge success as animals, their spread throughout the world, are the direct result of making use of the conditions provided by man, following him wherever he goes. When, I wonder, shall we see the first mouse on the moon? <laughs>